I am Kelly McMasters. I am the Director of Publishing Studies in the English Department here, and I also teach nonfiction. And I also want to um, just thank the series coordinator, Marcy McGee. Um, I came bounding into her office one day after um, listening to uh, Pamela Paul and, um, at a library, and she was like, we have to bring her here. And Martha, um, as usual, said, okay. <laughs> and Martha, as usual, said, okay, let's make it happen. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, and uh, our next Great Writers uh, reading series is November 14th, um, and that is another nonfiction Mark that on your calendar to make sure you can make it. Um, so today we are here. Daniel Mendel. Oh, sorry, did I not say Daniel Mendelssohn? Yes, which I'm sure you can see in front of you over there. Um, so that'll be exciting. But our big deal tonight is Pamela Paul. Um, as I said, I first heard Pamela Paul at the Port Washington Public Library, which is my local library. And what I loved most about that night was the way she interacted with the audience. So speaking of big deals, um, Pamela Paul, most people well, in the writing world know her as the editor of the Dark Horse Book Club. But what was great was watching her uh, interact with what was mostly a sort of, um, I'll say, older audience, um, you know, your typical public library audience of um, grandmothers. And, um, and they were really uh, stalwart, stalwarts from the neighborhood. So Pamela Paul grew up. Fort Washington, and uh, that's where I live now, and that's why I happen to be in the library. And on, so here's this amazing uh, literary star, and they all wanted to talk to her about um, the about the house that she had lived in as um, as a child because it had just dramatically burned down to the ground the week before, and they all they just had sort of an impromptu community meeting instead. Um, so it was just she was so generous. And wound up um, talking just so wonderfully, wrapping it back into literature and her life and things like that. And I thought that was really interesting. So, and this is her gift. She is game to consider any topic. Uh, she has written on parenting and porn. Um, she's testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee, and she's developed one of the most loved columns of the New York Times. Um, so she's also a book author. She's a journalist, editor, and also a book author of many books. Uh, one is The Starter Marriage and the Future of Matrimony. Another is Pornified, How Pornography is Transforming Our Lives and Relationships in Our Families. There's also Parenting Inc., How We Are Sold on $800 Strollers, Fetal Education, Baby Sign Language, Sleeping Coaches, Toddler Culture, and Wipe Warmers, wipe warmers and What It Means for Our Children. That's what I call them. Um, and then Buy the Book, uh, Writers on Literature and the Literary Life from the New York Times Book Review. That's what I am. And then the book we are here to celebrate tonight specifically, and they are for sale in the back, uh, My Life with Bob, Laud Heroine Keeps Book of Books, Plot Ensues. So let's welcome her to the podium. She's going to talk a little while, then I get to ask her some questions, then you get to ask her some questions. So Um, I mentioned this earlier when I was talking to students, but um, it's exciting to be out here because my father was a Hofstra alum, so, so, and I've never been here before. Um, so it's great to be here. Um, so this book uh, came out um, very distinctly from an experience of failure. And that failure was, um, I was essentially a, a failed teenage diarist. Like many children who knew that they wanted to be a writer, I knew what I had to do was just to keep a diary. That's what girls did. Um, and so I would go out uh, to the local stationery store with um, much ambition and pick out a blank journal, usually with a unicorn or a butterfly on the cover or a rainbow. Um, and then I would go back and, and fervently write in it um, at the end of each day. And, uh, and I had great hopes for this. I thought that one day, you know, these diaries would surely be discovered. And there would be an announcement, and they would be collected, and perhaps published, and reach a wide readership. Um, the reality is that I would write in it fervently for a few days, and then I would go back and I would read what I wrote. 
and what I read was terrible. Like, first of all, the content could not have been more mundane. It was always, you know, fights with my friends. You know, Katie said she couldn't sleep over my house, but her mom wouldn't let her. And then I found out she slept over at, Kate, at Ingrid's instead. Um, and the writing itself was terrible too. The prose was nondescript. It wasn't special. There was no sign of slow march or slow steam. Or, um, and and so I would, you know, put the diary aside and then go to the stationery store and I would start again. And I realized finally at the age of 17 uh, that uh, this wasn't working. Uh, there was no sign of a budding writer in here. And I decided to do something new, which was to keep a journal of not what was going on in my life as I was growing up in Vermont, this town of Port Washington, but what was going on in the life as I wanted to read it, often as I frankly really was, as opposed to thinking of the world of books. So I started a blank book um, with uh, the title and author on it. Um, when I was 17, I was living in France at the time. And the first book that I put in there was The Trial by Kafka that I had chose to read. Um, and it ended up being, in retrospect, a very fitting kind of book. Because I was living in France. I was a student um, on the American Field Service. And uh, like most teenagers, I was bitter and unhappy and resentful of the world. I had ended up being sent to a tiny little town in a remote corner of France that was so sort of you know obscure and awful that when I tell people French people where I was, they would say, "Wow, c'est tout le monde," and it really was. It was just it was a, a, a nowhere town, and it was my first time abroad. And I thought surely this was because my mother had sent me on the cheaper AFS program rather than the more exper expensive experiment in international living. And I didn't like the, I didn't like jet lag. I didn't like the town I was in. I didn't like learning French. Um, and in a way, the trial sort of ended up being a kind of perfect metaphor for that kind of um, ungrateful adolescence. When you feel like the world is like set against you. You feel like you know maybe you've done something wrong. Certainly, everyone else thinks you've done something wrong. And of course, in the trial, we have Kay, who's arrested for a crime um, that he doesn't think that he's committed, but maybe he has. Um, and persecuted for it, and that's how I felt. And over time, I came to realize that this journal, this book that I was reading, in a way reflected my life better than a regular diary would. Um, it, and, and not only because the book sort of captured where I was at a moment, but each moment then led to the next. When read over the long you know, span, you could kind of track the trajectory of my life. You know, I made the decision to go from, say, um, the trial to a student of a novel or whatever it might have been. So I kept this journal uh, faithfully. I didn't particularly talk about it. It's funny to be so off the map. Um, as I point out in my book, when I was growing up, being a reader was not a particularly um, coveted thing in a person, certainly not in a child. You could you know, do ballet or play the piano or you know outdoor activities that required basic skills of coordination, which I did not have. No one sort of said, like, my child is such a reader. That basically was not um, and so I didn't really talk about this this diary much personally, but fast forward to 2012, at which point I was working as an editor at the New York Times Book Review, and we wanted to start up a kind of profile. And we were trying to figure out how could we make a profile that would feel particular to this age group. And the idea behind Buy the Book was that you could tell the story of someone's life through the books that they read. Heroines that they admired in books, these are authors that they cherished, these are books that they wanted to finish, these are genres that they loved, these are authors they would want to read. And in order to explain this idea, which kind of seemed obvious to me, to our readers, um, I decided that I would write an essay about the book. And the only way really to illustrate it was to actually go into my diary. And I have to say, you can imagine the kind of embarrassment of taking your diary and um, scanning it in at the New York Times and then having it printed in the New York Times and posted online forevermore. That's kind of what I went through with this essay. And it's reprinted in my license book now in the New York Times. Um, it's a copy of it or you can't see it on the screen. But it had things like, of course, starting off with Kafka, and it had Joyce, and it had Faulkner, and it had Jane. But it also had things like a memoir by the rodent in the door. And you know the fact that I couldn't finish the tribute of the vampire because it was a little too important to keep next to. Um, but what what was wonderful was when I when the by the book came 
out. Um, and this accompanying essay came out. Uh, there was a huge outpouring of email, email from people, and letters that came in from mail mail, and many of them were accompanied by photocopies that, of people who were showing me their own books and books. Um, and I kind of felt like I had found this like hidden tribe of fellow dorks who did this thing. Weirdly, I just got back from Asheville on Monday, and when I was in the airport, I was sitting there, and someone saw me reading, and this older guy, and he was from Indiana, and unprompted, not knowing what my job was, not knowing that I'd written this book, he said, I keep a little address book of all my books, alphabetical by author, put a little R next to them, and I was like, oh my god, I'm like giving off some weird vibe, this is just like coming to me now, not even knowing. Um, so I, I by the book ended up becoming very successful in the book review, and a few years later, I anthologized that um, in a collection. So after that book came out, my editors asked me to lunch, and the talk had happened. They just want to know, like, well, what's the next book? So my answer was, uh, the next book is going to be another by the book. We have more of them, and I think we can do a volume. And they said, no, 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 that's not what we want at all. Actually, we have an idea of our own. Do you remember that essay that you wrote about your book of books with Bob? And I said, yes. And they said, well, why don't you write a book about that? So there were a few things that were troubling me about that concept. First of all, writing a book, for those of you who have done it, you know, it's just a hard thing to do, and your heart has to be in it. And it's a lot of work. So generally, it's something that people can't turn within. And if you really want to dedicate yourself to, I had never written a book that didn't come from my own, uh, you know, that, that wasn't my idea. And I also had a lot of trouble thinking about what this book might be, um, because it certainly couldn't be a book for this book. It was really quite awful boring. Moreover, like any diary, I actually consider my job to write about my book and to keep things private. So I didn't really want to share it. And I also didn't want to write a book that was about books that other people had never heard of, which I also thought was kind of boring. And in fact, given that I write about many books during my day job, it's not much an interesting stretch for me. So I couldn't figure out what the book would be. And moreover, I couldn't figure out when the hell I would write it. Because I, at that point, had a very full-time job. And I have three full-time kids. And most people who work full-time and write a book will do things like write it on the weekends. That wasn't an option. I'll wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning. I ended up with this kind of brilliant idea I thought at the time, which was um, I was living in Harlem, but I was moving to New York to do some freelance writing. I'd been on the stage. Or I'd been on the Estella, and if you've been on the Estella, you know it's just the stage is first. You have this really nice big table, and this is like my laptop, and I just set the keyboard and I just apply it far. So I thought my writing is going to be in my old job, still not knowing what the book would be, and trying to find it. Then I got onto Metro North, which I'd never been on, <laughs> and it was a little bit of a shock to realize there weren't even trade tables, but it was too late. I signed the contract, I'd taken the money, and now I have to do it. I also have to out what the book would be. So I started to contemplate, you know, what would this book be about? If it's not about the book, what if it's really about me? And it's not about the list of books. I got into what the, what it was that I thought that it would be. And essentially it came down to the things that my books were for me, which was the way in which books illustrate the human divide between people and us, the way those stories were told to me or me. You know, the fact that you could be having a really great day, but if you pick up, say, the new memoir, Wave, by Sonali Devanayaga, and you start reading about the story of a woman who is an economist, who was on vacation in Sri Lanka with her two children, her boy was five and seven, and it was the 19th century, and this was the birthplace of the first suffrage in the 19th century, and that wave came Live. I heard this talk about it without crying. And in fact, I was having a really great day one day, and I started reading that book, Change, by the time I got up, and the tears were coming down my face. And so what's the reality of what my day is like when I'm reading this story? Or is it reflection of what's going on in my own life? So I wanted to write about that, about that state secret of the book reader, and the fact that what we read at any given moment in our lives affects us, what, where we are in our lives drives where we read. I wanted to write about the fact, you know, for example, you could take the book out of your rental and you can read 
picked up while she was young and romantic. And she said, Katie had one boyfriend. And she said, oh, this is so crazy. She had meant to be with Quincy. You know, but you read that book if you're, let's say, newly married and you have a child. She's abandoned her child. Um, if you read that book, then when you're much older, you know, you feel a little uncomfortable. Um, and so, you know, it really depends on where you are. It depends on who you are. You know, where we each are coming from can lead to some novel and all kinds of weird conversations. And I have this every day at work, where we're all about the same book and have the same conversation. And it gets very confusing. I mean, there's the, there are books that my colleagues read that talk about wildly that I think are despicable. Um, and you know, vice versa. So I wanted to write about why that is, and about all the questions that readers, real readers, ask themselves. What should I be reading? How do you read this? Why is it should I be reading? And are there books that one should be reading, or is that something that tells you that you should read something that's false? Is it okay to read in comfort, or should books make you uncomfortable and make you feel comfortable? What does it mean to be well read? I, I'm one of those people that's always been kind of hounded by that notion that one should like really feel like one should read before one decides to fly. Is there a right way to read a book? What kind of book am I trying to read? What do we want to get out of the book? You know, is that the way we should be thinking about it? Why does one join a community of books? And that is really interesting to me. Why does one join a book book club? Reading a book is such a private And one of the things that drove this book came out of my own book club. Um, I had actually always not wanted to join a book club because I don't want to read what I don't want to read. Like someone in the book club picked up some book that month that I don't want to read. I don't want to be in that club. But this was a book club I joined for a very particular reason, which is because though the group is entirely grown up, many of us don't even have children in the group, um, uh, it was a group of very literary So I could still read the right books, but then also have my own time. So I was in my book club one night, and we were having this very angry um, or uh, volatile argument over a book. Some of us loved it, others didn't like it, such as why isn't Cinderella in this book? And, uh, and, and in the middle of this argument, one woman stopped and said to me, and she was actually one of the few people in this book club who doesn't put up her hand. You know, members of the book club are there's reluctant authors in the club, there are some agents, there are publishing houses, there are publishing houses. Um, but she was a child psychologist. And she said, I think that the reason we're fighting about this book so much is we're reading it for different reasons. So why do we read it? And it was a question that made me think. I mean, there's a bunch of people who work in the world of books that I've thought about already, but yet we're kind of stumped by such a simple, basic question. So we all thought about it and we went around the table and everyone about the world, or you read me for different reasons, or you read space, or I read science fiction for different reasons than science fiction. And then some answered were more complicated, like, well, I read, I used to read accounts on how that when my father died, I started to read some of my books. And I think that for all of us, we probably had different answers at different times in our lives. And I thought about, well, what was my answer? And what I came to for me personally is that I, I read read to have an experience in a book that I can't read in any other way. And for me, and I know this is different for everyone, but some people will say, I like to see my own experience reflected in a book because I want to read it. I don't want to read about a mother of three commuting every day to an office, you know, hounded by a 24-7 news cycle. That's boring. I know that story very well, but I do want to read about Sonali Jelani Yagaraj. I do want to read and be able to experience things in a book that I could never otherwise access. I could never read a coal miner in 19th century France if I couldn't read Romeo and understand what that book is like. I will never live on Mars if I can't read a Mars book. But in any case, I like the movie. Um, I, I, but I want to be able to enter into other worlds and enter into other perspectives and be able to access things that I could never access. But I think that one of the reasons that books stay with us and stay powerful is that with 
those people who are having so much of an issue with authority. If you read Harry Potter for the first time, for example, and you've never seen a movie, you are imagining what's going on in that room. So if you read a book called The Secret of Nero, you're trying to imagine you know, what, what it would be like to be in that scene. Sorry, I'm not having any trouble already writing. But in any case, you're in there, you're active, you're creating that story, you are part of that story. I think that it's because of that that books are such a huge platform for storytelling. It's so powerful and so empowering for all of us. Um, I usually go into this, and, and then I read about, I, I talk about one of the books that changed my life, because that is a question that we're all often asked, and there is a chapter in my book about that. But I'm not going to talk about that for a couple of reasons. One is that there are some people here who were sent this afternoon with some students who hadn't heard about the story, and so I don't want to repeat it. The other is that I learned something recently in my time uh, where I was for a literary festival. And what I learned is this. So I don't usually like to read books that are too complicated. The reason I don't like to read it is when I read it, the editor in me wants to cut it. So I end up reading it in the way I think I should have written it. Um, and I try to improve it as I go along. And so it ends up being a very unpleasant thing where I think, God, I need a new edition so I can fix this. When I was in Iceland, I was with a group of readers for a literary festival. And they started it off, they kicked it off with this reading where everyone and the, all the writers in the group went up and they had to read a portion. And I was sitting next to this Icelandic writer. And I looked over and his book was covered with colored paper all over the pages. And I was like, what is this? What, 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 what's wrong with this book? And he said, oh, I've edited it completely. I fixed it entirely. And I read this. And I thought, oh, wow. Like, I, you, you, now I, I'm going to do that. And so you can see. I have crossed out entire sections of this book that I'm going to read for you. I'm going to get the new and improved edited version of one of the stories in my book. So I'm going to tell you sort of how I ended up a little bit in terms of the process fixing that problem of like, well, how can this actually be a book? It's not only about me, and it's not about the book, but it's also about the story. So every chapter in this book is named after a book that was in my book of books. It's one of those laws that I set out for myself. No one else could have written this book. It was written to me. And that each chapter would somehow capture what that book did for me in my life, but also something about the reading experience for all of us. Because I think that, that the memoir shouldn't just be sort of a personal narrative book. It really should be something that we can all relate to in some way. So this is a chapter called The Secret of Cambodia. It's named after a book by Sheldon Gray. Um, he's a former Long Islander. Um, and the theme of the chapter, the subtitle is The Complicated Narrators. Specifically, in this case, it's a very specific narrator who is traveling. Um, because when you're traveling, you read a travel book, it's like going on a trip with someone. And you would like the narrator or the protagonist to be able to talk to you first and then to talk to you. Okay. So I'm going to read you this sort of highly edited. Um, just to set the scene here, I was living in Thailand at the time. This was right after college. I was in my early 20s. The friends I made living in Thailand were friends of Circle C. Angela, a yellow-haired English minister's daughter who wore brightly colored jewelry and said she had passion for karate. Brad, a 50-something history teacher from Hawaii who worked for the Thai Student Union. Alma, a Swedish backpacker I hung out with on the beach, seeing me the only other cool girl on Christmas Eve and the holidays. Each provided a Companionship and protection. He probably never would have crossed the Kalenjo home, and if he had, we'd have each swiftly moved on. Here he comes home. Let me say another thing. This is before the internet or cell phones. So when I was in Thailand, I was in Kalenjo and I didn't have cell phones. I didn't even have a landline. And I didn't have a mobile phone. It would have been great to have had a real friend to travel with. It would have been even better to have had a real boyfriend to travel with. Instead, when I decided to go to Cambodia in the spring of 1994 for the Cambodian New Year celebration, I met Tyler. A former Navy sailor, Tyler was the smartest and worldly American I'd met in Shanghai, and my most recent companion in the last decade. I could go into a long thing about why I didn't meet Tyler. Now, here's another point about editing. The next part, my editor really wanted me to cut out. He was adamant about it, and I was equally adamant about putting it in. But even though it's disgusting, I couldn't possibly put it in because I didn't want to see me cutting out the things that were important. The most noteworthy thing about Tyler was the way he peed at night. His toilet was located on the first floor of the house, a steep and narrow staircase that goes into the upstairs bedroom. 
to avoid a precarious descent into dark night down before a ladder than a flight of stairs. He rigged a long plastic tube from the first floor toilet up the side of the house and leaned over the second floor bedroom. At night, he simply released into the plastic tube and the runoff would make its way down to the bowl. Tyler's system, alas, did not accommodate women. He was kind of a solo operator, generally. I just like it a little bit. Um, some of you. He was kind of a solo operator, generally. Though he and I didn't know each other well, we managed to find something to fight about while waiting for our flight to turn on time. Before boarding, we mutually decided to go our separate ways. My travels in Asia were too precious to be compromised by bad company. By sheer luck, I wound up at the Renoxo, an elegantly dilapidated French colonial hotel directly across from the Royal Palace. It was a step up from my usual grubby guest room, but I wanted to avoid bumping into Tyler with an excuse for a public appearance. Renoxo is a pageant that was trying to come out for a kind of festival very different from those of the Arabian Peninsula. Instead of missionaries and sex tourists, there were academics and artists and nonprofit workers from the birth of the United States. Here were the people I'd been thinking of taking a trip on. Just a little bit of background Cambodia at that time was in the middle of a war. Mayor Reed was still active in the North of Asia. Um, they had just kidnapped and killed some of his own family workers in the Civil War, um, at least a lot. There weren't a lot of uh, tourists there um, at all, but the UN, the UN, what's called UNCLOS, the world council of UN government, was here. So uh, it's an interesting thing. Despite parting ways with my ostensible traveling companion, who treated my departure much easier, I soon found good company. Based on title alone, I picked up a copy of Coming to Cambodia by Sheldon Gray, a theater director, monologuist, and author who began his time in Hong Kong. It's hard to describe the intensity of emotion leading from Cambodia, coming to Cambodia, to Gray's monologues about his experiences playing a small role in the Indian Revolution. There was an immediate call to the stage. Sheldon Gray was my first literary crush. There's no romance in this book, it was rather a sense of total and complete identification. True, Sheldon Gray was a Indian prophet, and he was working in avant-garde theater in Soho, and I was a near unemployed college grad from Long Island. I didn't share Gray's struggles with drinking or his depression or the legacy of a suicidal mother, but I'd never, in reading her personal narrative, felt such a close affinity with the writer. It was as if we viewed the world through a shared lens. I found funny what he found funny and sad what he found sad. When I read him, I felt like I appreciated what he wrote in a way he wanted to be appreciated, and that he appreciated that. Just reading Spalding seemed to magically forge connections to like-minded people. After noticing me reading Swimming to Cambodia over breakfast at the Renoxe one morning, the documentary filmmaker staying down the hall asked me to join him for coffee. His previous project had included work with the makers of the Swimming Tales, and now he was making a film about landmines in Virginia Theory's Nova. At the time, Cambodia had one landmine for every seven inhabitants. We talked about coming to Cambodia and William Shawcross's sideshow, which he also recently read, and then, as if these books aimed me passage, he invited me to join him and his friends on a local charter in the Mekong River every Friday afternoon. Also on board was Connie, a scholar of ancient Chinese poetry at Lehigh, a stunning American businesswoman named Heather, who made a fortune in China while simultaneously getting a PhD from MIT, an anthropologist also named Heather, who had been working at the Sackler Museum in Beijing, Lindsay, a corporate lawyer from San Francisco who was assisting the Cambodian government to create laws related to women's issues, and an unidentified gray-haired man who spoke with authority about everything from the peak of the Vietnamese cultural religion, Taoism, to the origins of the Vietnam War. And there was me. The first few minutes were awkward as my fellow passengers introduced themselves in terms of their respective achievements. Then they asked what I did, and I said something nebulous about working in Thailand. So, Um, I tried hard to act like a legitimate participant in the conversation until Lindsay, the lawyer, challenged me on my personal ethnic-American bias. What do you mean exactly by matriarchal? How is Cambodian so called matriarchal? I overheard him say something very silly. I quickly downshifted to thoughtful nods. I tagged along for drinks afterward at the Foreign Correspondence Club, where we were met with a scene straight out of Somerset Maugham, complete with spinning giant, sorry, enormous spinning fans on the ceiling and a long wooden bar. Everyone knew everyone else from earlier newspaper stings in East Hong Kong and Singapore. Reporters and published academics swarmed the scene. By comparison, I had written for the Amazon and World of Science Publication. For years, Spalding Gray remained the subject, the object of my literary fantasy. The authors I'd been obsessed with as a teenager either had been long dead or were strong spiritually out of reach. But Spalding was different. He was alive. Spalding was famous in his way, meeting him didn't feel entirely outside the realm of possibility. 
a world with confusion and coincidental happiness. When I moved back to New York and lived in the East Village in the mid 90s, it was stated I was the kind of woman I wanted to work with. Part of me couldn't help but believe that once you knew who I was down deep down, you would understand that we were meant to be friends. I think about life being small and kind of easy. I just had the one in my life. I too was obsessed with Ophelia. I too had been dreaming of being Mrs. Lamb. Spalding had been for meditation retreats. I had seen gyrating testicles on the wall and tried to meditate. I had thought about trying to meditate, but hadn't because I was certain something would have distracted me, though probably not balls on the wall. Whatever happened, I'd tell him about it. Walking through his Soho neighborhood, I would plot our inevitable encounter. But whatever opening gambit I used, and there were not many in my head, I came across as crumbling and desperate. He, Spalding, huge fan of your work. Spalding Gray, sorry to be so direct, but I really think we should be friends. Would you like to have lunch? It never happened. I walked through his neighborhood to work for two years and attended every one of his shows in New York. Finally, in 1999, I went to a book signing and made a fondling verbal commitment. I signed my copy of Morning, Noon, and Night. I can't wait to read this book. Um, I think we're going to go on to questions with you and then questions from everyone else. And feel free to ask any questions about this book, about the New York Times book review, about book coverage at the Times, about the New York Times, which means not about Trump anything overly political, um, and uh, maybe Bill is next. Next time, please. Uh, thank you so much. So, um, folks, what do you think? Tyler and the urine tube, should that have stayed? <laughs> yes? Yes, yes. Right. I think we agree with you. <laughs> Live stream, my editor will watch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so don't edit that in the next page. Um, so I'm wondering, when you said that you were usually talking about a particular story, was that the wild swan? Well, you know, it's interesting. There was Wild Swans and Journey of One's Own. There were two books that I thought were really transformative in yeah. different ways. Um, yeah, I, well, I wondered, because, I mean, I'd like to hear your version. Wild Swans, you know, she writes, she's in China, she writes in one of our wild swans, and I love this mixture of, well, first, the way that the memory of the book now transports you to that moment. You have yourself freezing in a hot room and in a windbreaker, you know, and she's sort of shrieking, I have no nest to say. Um, <laughs> and, but maybe my question is how you then research and trust that memory, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about that story and then how you went about putting that on the page. Yeah. So the story is, has anyone here read, read Wild Swans by Jung Chong? It's a great book. It was published in 1999. Um, but it's uh, a memoir. Jung Chong is an academic at Ceylon in London. Um, but she grew up in three generations of her family. Her, her grandmother was a concubine to a Manchurian warlord. Her father was a senior official in the Communist Party. And she ended up being a Red Guard during the Communist and the Revolution. And um, she eventually uh, left to China and moved to London. Um, and I read that book. I was traveling in China. I'm going to try to make a very long story short. I was traveling in China. I'd gone to a place that I hadn't planned to go to, which was um, outside of the council of Gunmuchi in the Uyghur Autonomous Region, which is a new law over to the subway to the city there. It's not a peaceful place. Um, and uh, it is way off in western China. It was so foreign. They were so unused to me that you could say, Um, and that would be very clear to you if you had ever seen anyone that was from Pakistan or from America before. So um, it, I was very much out of my element, and I really went there knowing nothing because I hadn't planned to go there. I would planned to go to Tibet, and when I went to the jumping off place in Tibet, the travel agent very mysteriously said to me, I can sell you a ticket to Tibet, but I can't sell you a ticket to China. I'm not going to go to Tibet. Um, so <laughs> I, I ended up in, at this place I hadn't planned for, although I had read one book about it that had tantalized me. And it Called the Seven Lake by Vikram Seth. Some of you might know he's a very big novel, epic novel of the Little Boy. So it's a smaller travel book. And he wrote about this, this lake called Heavenly Lake, which is outside of Gunmuchi, um, in what he described as um, this kind of oasis in the middle of a hush tent region in the desert. And uh, the Lonely Planet also was wildly acclaimed. Um, and I went there, it was April. And I came from Thailand where it was the summer. So I had, I think, 
and I packed up all of my stuff into an overnight locker and I joined with a guy to go to a bigger um, church, or sorry, a Kazakh church um, in this oasis to spend the night. And other people on, in my group were um, a Korean football player and this German border guard um, and the Kazakh guide. And we got there and um, the package was supposed to be, you know, horseback riding by Pope Kevin Lake, frolicking in the water, you know, then you spend a nice night in this Oasis church and then you go off on your next destination uh, the day after. So I packed lightly, brought my one book. Um, I thought I'm not going to have much time to read. I was near the end because I was just frolicking in the middle of the night. And I got up there and I realized, you know, an oasis in Israel in northwest Eritrea did not know. Um, and so it was very cold and we were holding the reins and my hands shaking. Um, so we called off the horseback ride after a while. We all became shivered. And no one spoke any English. They each spoke a little bit of broken Mandarin. They each spoke amongst themselves and talked about the past of their day. And I chose not to participate in that, but to finish my book. So I went to bed. I did not go to sleep. I'm sorry to see a theme here, but I did <laughs> really need to use the bathroom before I went to bed. But I thought, you know, no, 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 I really don't want to wander out in the dark, uh, you know, desert night by myself to find a, you know, patch of grass. I'll wait until the morning. So I went to bed. I woke up. I was desperate to go to the bathroom. I opened up the flap, and it was snow. The snow was this deep. It was like a white out of blizzard. And the other people in my party were like, well, we're here for the long haul. And I was like, no, no, no. I am not staying here. Moreover, I don't eat red meat, and I do drink coffee in the morning. Um, and so the meal that was prepared by the Kazakh woman who was the kind of spiritual leader, uh, she gave me some kind of large food, but I don't know what it was. Um, and some kind of unidentified food made a meal that I did not eat. So the next morning, I had never had red meat prepared. But there was no water. There was just this large water left over from the meal. And I was not going to make myself suffer. So I was also passing the side. And I woke up. And I could hear her getting up and up, not staying. And it was like a 40-mile walk to the next village to keep me going. So we trekked along. And I had spent the night reading the story about wild swans. And as I was walking along, I was thinking about Zheng Chang's story of the deprivation that she had suffered and as, as a red guard. What happened was, for those of you who know Chinese history, they emptied out the schools, threw away basically all the books except for the Mao Zedong Red Book, and she had to work out in the fields on farms. And this was not just her apartment, it was like her college. She was just run out of her time um, with boredom and with feeling like she was leading a life that she didn't want to live. She had no choice. And I thought, and then later on, when she becomes an academic and she has access to books and everything that she wants in life and mind, it's like the most incredible joy to her. And I thought, I'm never going to know what that's like. I can never read and describe it. I can never have a cup of supper. So I was going along on this this walk that was really unpleasant, I have to say, in the snow. So, you know, they, the, the yurt, the woman in the yurt was like, do you want my little acrylic scarf, which normally I would never have stolen off of like a, you know, accepted from this impoverished woman. So I was like, I will take your scarf. You know, I would take anything. It was so cold. Um, by the time I got to the village, my feet had bled through two layers of socks. Um, you know, my sneakers were ruined. And uh, but as I was going along, I was sort of saying to myself the mantra of like, "Accept your suffering. You can't suffer in this place when I know what it is to be comfortable." And when I got to the end of it, I I, I thought that wasn't quite enough suffering because it was just you know a day of walking. And I, what I really wanted to do was replicate that in some way. And so I thought, well, what would be the worst deprivation for me? And, you know, taking my book would be terrible. But I thought, really, what would be awful for me is uh, not being able to eat. Because I have the metabolism of a little toddler. I'm like, any food I have, I take a bag of Twizzlers, eat it in my bag. I, I eat, like, every two hours. And I eat a lot of candy and things that are not good for you. But I, if I don't eat every two hours, I get unhappy. So I thought, I'm going to not eat. Um, for the rest of my time in China. Now, obviously, I'm not crazy. I said, what I will do is I will have one serving of rice or bread, depending on if I'm in a rice region of China or a bread region. And then every three days, I'll allow myself a bowl of cool broth because I've become kind of excited and disgusted. And I did get sick. Um, but I, and it was really hard. It never got easier. But I kept saying to myself, um, as this kind of mantra as I went along, like, you have to suffer. You have to suffer to understand what it is to enjoy something. And I lasted. For four weeks, I broke. I was I broke in Beijing. I was walking out of the Forbidden City, and as I left the Forbidden City, even though I had two weeks more in China, there was like a dan dan noodle stand, and like the smell of the chilies and the cilantro. I just was like, "What the fuck have I been?"
been doing. And I just I <laughs> ran to that stand and I got like three servings of noodles and I ate them and that was over. But I did really appreciate it. Um, and I have to say, like, it was a terrible experience, but I don't I don't think in the course of my privileged lifetime I would ever otherwise own anything remotely like that. So it's interesting that you say, you know, what did you do to, to kind of work or like revive those memories? Because I I didn't want to go back into the books and like find relevant passages and all of that. And I also have a thing where in writing about these earlier periods of my life, I wanted to rely on my memory of them. I didn't want to try to reconstruct them from a new layer. So interestingly, I have never Googled China where I lived. And I have never Googled, you know, Ibuchi or some place. I didn't want to get some new sort of information that would interfere with what my experience was at the time. Because a lot of what memoir is about is trying to reconstruct the way you saw something and felt about it at that time in that place. And if you take in kind of new information, you're ultimately altering that. And it's an interesting thing with memoir because, you know, I've had, I remember a friend of mine wrote a memoir, uh, a really great memoir, and she was interviewed by Terry Gross on NPR. And um, Terry said to her back in memoir, she said, you know, you come across a speech and it's kind of, you know, wet. And my friend said, well, you know, Terry, um, I was trying to get into the mind of an adolescent as I was at the time. So, you know, I wasn't going to pretty it up, but that's kind of what it, I think is part of, of, of writing a memoir. You have to kind of recreate how you saw something at that time in order for it to be authentic in that moment. So, I think there are many other people who mm -hmm. are much more interested in this field. I had a, um, a, a workshop getting them to a friend and the friend between us was going through a divorce and she was very young, she was in her early twenties. And my friend said, Oh, I have a book for you. It's called Starter Marriage and, and I was like, Oh, Pamela Paul. Um, but you even though some of your books come out of personal experiences, they're very deeply journalistic. Yeah. So was there did you have to fight that impulse? No, it was. I mean, it was a very different process because the starter marriage was not about me. I think I used the first person in the first two paragraphs, and then I left it behind. And I mostly, um, I did a lot of research. I interviewed academics, but most of the research was interviewing fifty people who'd been married and divorced at a young age to kind of find out what their experiences were like. Because I didn't want it to be just about me, and also I had no perspective on it at that time. I had just split up with my husband three months before I signed the book deal. So it, it, for me, it was like it was a it was a almost personal personal but journalistic experience to kind of try to understand that. Um, and with the other books, I mean, they really didn't come out of it. Fortified came out of no personal experience. And, you know, people, it, it's very disappointing when you go on a media tour because they're like, what happened? And I'm like, nothing. I wrote a story for time and I thought it should be a book. Um, but uh, what was harder about this, easier and harder, is that there was no research, there's no reporting to do. I didn't need to consult with anyone. It was all internal. The harder thing is, is that I wasn't trying to prove a point, I wasn't trying to build an argument. I wasn't trying to marshal evidence. There was nothing, there was no drive to it other than whatever I could create from the narrative. And so that made the writing of it much harder um, in its way. It's much more about the, the crafting of the story as opposed to, you know, anything journalistic where you're just kind of trying to get from paragraph A to B for information. Sounds like the writing process is really important. How often do you get published in the New York Times? <laughs> well, you know, one thing was is that first of all, I didn't think this was a memoir. When I signed it up, I was like, this is a book about me. And then in Publishers Weekly, it said Pamela Paul can write a memoir. And I was like, oh my God, I am. So I realized so belatedly that that is in fact what it what it was. And for someone, I, I like to write about other people. You know, a lot of writers were like the people in the back of the room, you know, watching everyone else and talking about them. We don't want to be the one like dancing in the middle of the room doing a job of things. So um, I was really nervous writing about my own experience. And I thought, well, what I'll do is, like, the writing of it has to be true. It has to be 100% true in a way that I can understand it. So I'll write it all out like that. And then, just a little safety measure, at the end, I'll reread it and I'll. Read it, sort of pretending like okay, I'm going to reread this as my thought, 
I'm going to reread it as like an employee. I'll reread it as my mom, as my ex-husband, as my child 20 years from now. And and I'll take out everything that like I think was that time. And then I, I didn't do that. Uh, and then, then it was too late <laughs> because the book came out. But, you know, I think it's probably a better book for that. Um, you know, you, you just you can't be that cautious. Um, and, and, uh, and uh, yeah. Um, I want Buddy, buddy, uh, crap. And suddenly we realize Margaret Atwood is the keynote speaker, and there's a whole group of fancy people um, at the New School celebrating book criticism. And it was wonderful. It was a wonderful experience for me to see how alive, see the students see how alive that is today and could be. Um, and you are in, in charge of the most important book criticism pages published today. Um, and I'm wondering when you write or read um, or decide, yes, that is good enough to publish, what do you look for in a book review in terms of kind of why you would ask somebody, maybe comparing re uh, readers and comparing on the book, and also just the actual sentence to sentence? Oh, well, I could talk about that for, you know, 15 hours, but <laughs> I'll, I'll try to just make a few important points. First of all, I think book criticism is vital. Book reviews are really important. This is a, a service for readers. It helps authors and publishers. You need to, like, criticism is essential for us to understand what's worthwhile, what works, and what doesn't. On the internet, you know, there's a lot of, of, of talk around books and enthusiasm, and I think that's all fantastic. Um, but there's also a lot of promoting and a lot of log rolling and a lot of, oh my God, I love that book, and you don't know that that's my sister who wrote it, and like a negative review on Amazon written by, you know, someone's ex-wife. So you, you, what you need is, I think, frankly, um, now more than ever with all of that cacophony is serious book criticism reviews where you have, you know, critics who've been vetted against conflict of interest to make sure that there isn't some kind of established friendship or enemy uh, relationship between the two of them, um, where it's fact-checked fact -checked, um, and edited and copy edited, where when you read a review, you can disagree with it, but you shouldn't distrust it. You should know that it is coming, that, that, that the person took the book on its merits. And I also think that book reviews in and of themselves can be a lively reading experience. It's its own art form. I mean, I read, I read many, many, many more book reviews and movie reviews than I see books, uh, see movies or read books. Because I like reading them. It's a great piece of writing. You pick up an Anthony Bourdain in the New Yorker, and no matter what he's reviewing, even if it's it's a movie you would never in a million years want to read. You're generally going to, you know, be engaged, entertained, and informed by what he's writing in some way. And the same, I think, holds true for a number of book critics, including um, our own at the New York Times. So, ideally, what a book review should be is, first of all, an engaging, entertaining, and informative, enlightening piece of writing. It should be something to be read in and of itself, whether you want to read the book or not. Um, in many cases, we know that people don't go through the book review and sort of read it cover to cover, thinking, which book should I read? They're reading them also so that they don't have to read the book. Um, you can learn a lot about a book just from a book review or about a subject. And there are many different kinds of forms of book reviews. You can have multiple books on a certain topic reviewed in a kind of multi-book review slash essay. Um, so it, 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 Again, it's a huge topic. It's very easy to talk about, too, what a bad book review is and what you don't do in a book review. Um, it's not an opinion piece. It's not an op-ed. You're not using the book as an excuse to talk about some issue and your opinion on it, your take on it. It's not a hot take. It's not a thumbs up or thumbs down. It's not a book report. Um, you need to have a reviewer actively engaged with the material. Um, and again, review the book at hand, not the book that they wish they had reviewed. Um, and to, you know, in a really good book review, you can go broader and deeper than the book itself in a way that reflects well on the book, that reflects on the author, on the subject, on the topic at hand, so that you can, let's say you're reviewing a history of Poland, you can contextualize it in terms of what else has been written about Poland, what other histories there are, sort of what the historiographical issues are, you know, with Poland. What does this mean for what we're seeing in Poland or Eastern Europe today? Is there any lesson that you could glean 
from this book about the, you know, the, the contemporary America. And then, you know, you can get into the writing itself and how does the person, what kind of research did the person do? What's the background of the author? What perspective are they coming from? What's the argument here? Um, and how is the writing? Is it is it is it is it mundane and, and sort of workmanlike, or does is this read in a novelistic you know way? Is it written in a narrative way? How is it organized? So all of that can come into play in a book. Aside from Well, I think you know one of the great travesties that we're seeing across the journalism world is the dearth, the defamation, really of local news. It used to be that you would write a book and you could expect it to end with a piece from across the country. You had every paper, you had a picture, they all ran for the pages. Now, when you have a book come out, you can expect maybe newspaper reviews, maybe a couple other places, and then you'll have places that'll like talk about it or enthuse about it, and that's all good. You know, it's all interesting, it's all informative, it's all publicity, et cetera. But it's really not the same thing as local news. Um, and so I think that that's, you know, that has, it's increased the power of the few places that are doing real book criticism um, in a way that I don't think is necessarily healthy. It's not helpful for readers. There should be a wide variety. And I also think, you know, the reason that you have local news is so that local newspapers can highlight local authors and books of local interest and can bring a perspective from that place to that book. Look, if Louise Erdrich writes a book about Native Americans, then you want to see that book reviewed all across any area of the country where there are Native American reservations, where there's a population, where there's a real history there. And that's almost everywhere. But that book will only probably get reviewed, even though she's a major author in a few newspapers. You know, the New York Times has the last freestanding book review in the country. The previous one was at the Washington Post, which folded Book World into Outlook in 2009, and the one to go down before that was in 2005, the Pittsburgh Chronicle. And you know, I don't. Very few newspapers even have one full-time critic in the United States. So, I mean, I know you're asking about the competition. I'm just laying this groundwork to show that it's kind of hard to, you know, there, there are very few outlets. I mean, there's the New York Review of Books, there's the New Yorker, but there's really only one or two reviews in there a week, and then the briefs. Um, and uh, there are a number of places, again, covering books that don't have a critic. New York Magazine no longer has a dedicated critic. Um, I think the Chicago Tribune does no longer have a dedicated critic. So the LA Times no longer has a dedicated critic. So, it's, um, you know, so there are very few places I could name. There are, there, there, there's still a lively um, book criticism going on in the UK where newspapers are still a little bit turned a little bit better. Um, so, um, there's book forum, um, but again, these are sort of small, specialized um, outlets. And the point of books is that books are for everyone. Books should be a mass medium, um, and they should be covered in the same, you know, way that, that television and, and and film are. Frankly, books are the source material for most of the good TV and, and movies out there. Um, and so this is like this is the genesis of ideas, and it should be really great, I think, for readers. Um, I want to leave time for questions. What we're going to do is bring the microphone up. Um, so if you do have a question, you can come to the microphone to ask while they're um, working on that part. I'm going to try and flip to buy the book. I'm sure you get oh, this no, all the time. I get this all the time. And then I'm like, these questions are terrible. How can anyone ask these of anyone? Who does this? Well, my first question is, we, um, is do you have a favorite book by the book? And then my other question. Um, well, you know, my favorite part of the book is probably the first one, which is the Red Yak. The person I wanted to talk to first was Lucy Sparrow. She challenged me to read Sparrow's book. And I thought, well, who wouldn't? He was very, he's an avid reader and he's so smart and funny. And he, he's also been a great supporter of, of, of writers. And those of you who have seen him perform know that at every show, he mentions at least one book that he's reading and often reads books out loud. And he's often a writer who has not gotten a lot of um, recognition before. And he can actually. Sort of the, the sales and awareness of that author in their book. So I think that's a really strong thing. Um, I have to say that he, at that point I didn't know David, and so emailing him out of the blue was very nerve wracking. And then 
uh, and then getting into email exchanges with him. And, and I remember like being in the car with a bunch of my family members, and I was like, well, what if I write? And they were like, don't be funny with the funny guy. Like, he's the funny guy. You're the straight person. You don't try to joke around. But when he said yes, um, that was huge. And I remember the second person I asked was Amy Dunham. And at the time, I remember my editors were like, who? And I was like, no, no, she's going to be in this big show thing that I think is going to be kind of big. Um, and the third person was Madeline Albright. And so the fact that, that, that I wanted to put that wide range of people. Because the, the idea behind Buy the Book is not just that it's a recommended list of books, because it definitely is for me. And I think, you know, I thought about it as like like a red carpet for dorks. Like instead of who are you wearing, it's like what are you reading? And um, But also, I think, and this is the kind of subtler way to read that column, it's a portrait of a person. So some people will write in and they'll be like, I can't believe that jerk. He didn't name any women writers. And it's like, well, you know, they said you should make him name you know, writers. Well, first of all, it's a fundamental misunderstanding of what a journalist does, which is not tell people how to answer questions when you interview them. That's like part of those basics. But also, isn't it interesting that that person only named eight male writers? Or isn't it interesting that that person only named writers that before World War II? Or isn't that fascinating that that person says she has 27 books on her nightstand and that somehow they miraculously cover every single race, ethnicity, genre, and, you know, country of origin? And she just happened to have them all lying there next to be read, you know. So it really does tell you a lot about a person, and I and I think that that uh, that to me is the is the more interesting way to read it. Hi, thanks so much for uh, your work. I to ask Tara. Um, I really appreciate the work that she's doing. Just like you. Oh, yeah, are you kidding? I love book reviews. I really do. I love negative ones, too. You know, people say, like, there are so few book reviews. Like, why would you write this negative book review? Why not just focus on the good books? Well, like, anything. You need to experience the bad to know what the good is. You know, you, this is, and again, it's journalism. Like, we're covering it, and if we're not going to kill a review because the critic didn't like it. Um, so, um, so that's part of the job. But to get to your first question, how has reading changed? I think that um, there's been so much research and so much better understanding of child development than the one I grew up when it was, you know, I grew up during the area of benign neglect. Now we grow up in the era of teleproductive parenting. And I think that people really understand now about um, the importance of reading um, to become a sort of, um, you know, intelligent, uh, uh, well educated adult actively engaged in the world. I think that. Especially right now, there's a lot of anxiety around reading because people are glued to their digital devices, and there's a lot of fear that people no longer have the attention span or the interest in a sustained narrative if they can't focus on a book. Um, and uh, actually, my next book is called How to Raise a Reader that kind of addresses that because I think there is there's a fear that people might not be reading anymore. I don't really share that fear. I think that people will always be drawn to uh, books as a, as a form of storytelling, and that people will always read stories. Um, but I do think that now people pride themselves on, on, on reading or on how much their child is reading. And there are, again, some of it is very anxiety fueled. You know, you have like these contests where people have book thons and they have to read a million books. If you did that when I was little, I know they existed, but like even I wasn't allowed to participate at that book a thon. You know, now like kids will do it, you know, and, 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 and the, like the kindergarten doesn't attempt to even get themselves into uh, Harvard, you know, 15 years later. Um, but uh, I think that um, I think that you know. So in that sense, I think reading is is seen as a as a as a as an important part of a child's life. Whereas when I was growing up, it was like get your nose out of that book. You know, stop reading. Like you're gonna go blind. You're holding the book too close. Like I remember if you if you brought your book to recess, you were in trouble. And I I like I hated outdoor activity. I hated camp. You know, I would bring a book like. Have to smuggle it in my backpack, and like if you were caught, that was just like the axe came down. Um, so, in that sense, it's important. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
um, skin, my rugged skin, not my skin. And uh, and I did a very rare thing, which I, I abandoned it on the day. I kind of came to this realization that it, there's something about that book that I don't like in the book, which is like I don't like that like um, that sort of you know jolly like you know sort of uh, British like look at that there you know that funny character there that strange fellow like I just it's like the Pickwick papers I don't like that. So I uh, the book I picked up um, that I'm reading now, which I actually just bought, is called um, Rage to Fame, and um, it has a second volume called Price to Fame, but the two volume biography of Peter Gerby. Here's a little gem for you. Who here has heard of Peter Booth's name? No? Okay. okay. So Clara Booth Luce was one of the great women figures of the 20th century. Um, she was everywhere that like anyone ever was. Uh, she did so many groundbreaking things, and even things that those of us who kind of know the sketches, the outlines of her lifetime, like would be surprised by unless you've read this read the biography. Is that true? Was that had any? Because I'm only halfway through. But she was married to Henry Luce, who was the publisher of Time Magazine, of uh, Time Magazine, the fashion magazine, and the whole empire of, of, of Time Life. Um, and she was an ambassador. She was a senator. She she did. A, she was an understudy when she was like five years old to Mary Pickford. Credit. She just. She was managing editor of Vanity Fair magazine. Um, she. She. She was just everywhere that anything was possible in the 20th century. It was an incredibly full life. And I started reading it because um, I was reading earlier this year another great book. Um, by Michael Pollan, and this is why I love the book of books, because you can then kind of follow that trajectory. So Michael Pollan's most recent book is called How to Change Your Mind, and it's about LSD and psychedelic books, and hallucinogens, and in it, in an offhand way, there's some great anecdotes in there um, of like figures who come now that you wouldn't expect that somehow had a, had a place in the, the world of LSD. One of them is Claire Booth Luce, because she and Henry Luce used to take LSD, and I thought, wait, what? She was like the Republican <laughs> senator and the ambassador, and they're like, how did that happen? So I don't know. That's probably in volume two. Uh, but that's why I started reading that. Okay. <laughs> so we do know each other. Now we know what now book you're working tricky. on now, but Um, the kind of books I wouldn't. There, there, there are articles that I want to write often before I want to write a book, um, and then to, you don't necessarily know if it's going to grow into a sustained narrative. And a lot of those are reported. I, I, I'm very interested in um, a few issues. A lot of the when I was writing um, narrative nonfiction or reported non sorry reported journalism for a couple of years for the Times and elsewhere, the things that interested me were often um, around health and science um, and education, and I'm interested in right now, especially um, the influx of technology and education and the impact that that's having. Um, so I would I would love to do that, but that's a kind of heavily reported book that I don't have time to do. And I'm also very interested in the long term impact of um, illness and the rise of diseases. And but again, like it's all heavily reported. Um, not enough. I've had, I've had my say about me. <laughs> Great. Well, we're so glad that you're here. And I hope that you'll all come back to book five um, when the time comes. And I want to thank the cultural people and the lawyers and the work to put this amazing series together that we're so lucky to have at your top today. Thank you, Pamela Paul, for coming here for your first time. Thank Hopefully you. Not your last.